Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast, a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs, from a mental, physical, and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo. And we are live. So welcome to a Coffee with Karen a cup of positivity with just a sprinkling of woo-woo. Now, I know recently we've been having more than, I would say, a sprinkling. We've been having a few tablespoons, I think. So we are going to maybe bring it back down a little bit (laughs) and get more on the mental and the physical side today. So in general, most of my guests tend to be coaches, healers, um, and they tend to be helping people on a mental, a physical or spiritual perspective, or any combination of those three. And so I'm your host, Karen Roberts. Um, I do come from a very, I would say, physical um, background from the fitness industry and sports therapy, so healing from that side of things. Um, I now tend to focus actually on helping other coaches and healers Uh, build their business, really, get them clients. So I find it really interesting to hearing everybody's stories um, as to how they ended up doing what they're doing. I find that always quite fascinating and what they are doing to help others. So uh, my guest today, I mean, the name is phenomenal, right? Moonshade, if you could explain to the uh listeners a little bit about who you are what you do and share a bit of your story thank you karen for having me on your show today um moon said actually oh so, <laughs> so sorry i've automatically gone for the <laughs> for the singer when you hear that i moon wish Spade. i was my apologies i wish i was i grew yeah. up with her and um she's just so influential and amazing isn't she <laughs> As you are, as you are. Thank you. Um, I am very much like you, a coach. I am a parenting health and wellness coach, um, and I help parents of high-functioning autistic children. That is my specialism, and that's what I do. Um, It's no... I guess it's kind of a no-brainer as to how I got here. I have two children who who are high-functioning autistic, um, and I was a secondary school teacher, so I spent about 18 years teaching in secondary schools, um, both top set and bottom set, and um, wide range of abilities. Quite a few of my students were special needs, They weren't always autistic, but they did have very different needs and a few of them were on the spectrum. Um, But it's more my experience with my own children that have led me to where I am. Um, Which tends to be quite common. I mean, it does tend to be, I suppose, it's a natural response. If we've overcome certain challenges and we know what it felt like before we had found the solutions. It's quite often a a, a natural response to want to go and help others so that they don't have to go through what you went through. Is that that how it sort of came about? Very much so, yes. Um, And for me specifically, because of high-functioning autism, it's different to moderate and low-functioning autism or severe autism. When... On the spectrum, when you're high functioning autism, you present in very different ways. But most common is the perception that you you present as normal or neurotypical Mm -hmm. um, in that high functioning autism is very much a hidden disability. And what you do and how you cope with it is very much something that happens kind of under the under the radar. It happens Um, behind closed doors so very few people actually know what it is or how you cope with it or what happens and for me personally and for a lot of parents of high functioning autistic children the challenges that you deal with the difficulties the, the problems the concerns they tend to become something that you deal with on your own because when you say to someone, I have this concern, 
a lot of the time it's dismissed because your child doesn't look autistic. They don't, ah. they don't seem autistic. They don't present as autistic. They just kind of, um, they're disruptive or, you know, they're just very, very active. They might be, they might have ADHD, but they don't. Um, right. Or you, you spoil your child or, you know, they don't have discipline or then there's the other aspect of it where they have a diagnosis and you have concerns, but then when you look at it, your child's concerns compared to parents who have children with severe autism, who have no mobility or are nonverbal, and then you think, my concerns are really not that ah. bad compared to someone else's. So what so I'm hearing there, are the two different aspects to that. It sounds like from what you're sharing there is, uh, and I can imagine maybe children that are high functioning could maybe get m bullied more. Would that be yes. right? Because they would be treated as quote unquote normal. I mean, I hate that yes. word. Whereas um, and then what it sounds like, then you suffer more because you want to do it yourself because you feel like people are going to perceive it as, oh, you're, you're you know, you're overdoing yeah. it or you know it's not as yeah. bad as this people will yeah. compare is that yeah. what's going on definitely very much yeah. so um and then you end up feeling really really isolated and you feel very lonely and you struggle a lot because the challenges are no less challenging they're no. just very different, different. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, that makes that yeah that makes a lot of sense i suppose when there's something that is obviously apparent due to how they look or how they walk or or whatever, um, I suppose, you know, we are, maybe there's more things that are set up for it. Would that be right? Yeah. And and yeah. Um, whereas a case, and then the teachers, I bet, I bet there's a bit of a challenge. They, they might just think that they're just being naughty um, yeah. as opposed to, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. I can see there that. So with your children... Um, yeah. how early did you, were you even aware? Um, we were aware with both our children from a very young age. My oldest, probably not that he was autistic right from the beginning. Um, he's in his twenties now, so we're talking quite a long time ago, but we did know that there were developmental anomalies that needed to be addressed but he doesn't he doesn't have the typical kind of um, indicators and markers of autistic children so you know when they talk about markers they talk about autistic children that stim which is where they self-stimulate so they kind of they always talk about children who flap their hands or who spin or who rock back and forth and uh -huh. my son doesn't do any of those things. So when I talked about issues with him, his teachers were just, he doesn't have any indicators of special needs. You see, he was really, really, and he is really bright. And most high functioning autistic children are extremely intelligent. They're articulate and they do what we call masking which is mm. exactly what it sounds like. They kind of don a mask where mm. they fit in with everything. They learn to mimic and they learn to copy what is going on around them so uh -huh. that they fit in. And unless you're watching carefully or you know, you don't actually notice that they are following and they're copying and they're reacting to things in the way that they see those around them doing. Um, and that was what was happening with mine. So right. he didn't have those kind of markers and indicators and the teachers would just say, he's very bright. He just needs a bit more focus and he just needs to be more disciplined. And <sighs> he's not, he doesn't have special needs. He's just disruptive and he needs to learn to sit in his seat through the lesson. And you're thinking, but these are indicators. <laughs> Something needs to be done. Yes. Um, and it didn't. Um, he was he was only first assessed when he was 13. Wow. 
yeah. okay so already hit uh see you know uh what, what do you call it now senior school <laughs> i'm still going back then but um so that must have been a challenge for him so he hasn't been assessed he's gone up to you know secondary, secondary school, yeah. school. <laughs> trying to think of the word there <laughs> uh and uh so is that did he have more challenges from there as opposed to primary school um no it was easier when we got to secondary school probably because I had been a secondary school teacher all along so ah. um, there was a little bit more respect for my experience and where I was coming from um when I said they were listening they were listening yeah. to you yeah and also because in secondary school it's more important because they've got to worry about their results GCSEs A-levels league tables, um, statistics, how many students are reaching A's and B's and C's. So it matters. And, you know, when you're saying that there's this really bright student that's not going to reach those markers unless something mm. is done, it matters because mm. that affects the tables, the statistics, and your standing in the, you know, ratings of schools and things like that. So eventually there was an educational psychologist brought in and the whole process started and by the time he was officially diagnosed he was 16. Wow I mean I suppose I mean I can understand it must be difficult for some you know with schools you know if there's a lack of funding because maybe if there's only one in a school that's that or there's different challenges um, yeah. amongst the school with the children it, it it seems to be you know you know there's gonna be there's quite a lot of children it sounds like that are having you know different whether whether it's autism whether it's yeah. something else or mental different mental health issues what do you think can be done what what do you think they can do in schools to to help a broader sort of uh, range of children um I think the most important thing is listen to the parents. That's very important because they know what goes on with their children behind closed doors. You know, with my, I knew what happened. We knew what was going on with him when he came home from school. We knew how he was coping with the stresses. We knew what was, how, how he was dealing with the difficulties and the challenges what they saw in school wasn't what we saw at home so right. that's one of the very important things don't just dismiss a parent's concern because and what, what, the ones... how do you know what the different sort of um i don't want to use the word symptoms but you know what 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 would you say is were the differences um in how they're reacting to certain stressors um, well, the thing about it is everyone reacts very uniquely because the, the combination that makes up being on the spectrum is extremely individualized to every single person. For mine, it, for him to deal with the stresses, it would take him about an hour to two hours after school of just complete downtime um, before we got him certain things that we we got him a cat and the certain toys that would allow him to kind of just lose himself in the day's stresses and he was bullied quite a lot in school so there was that we had to give him that time when he came home from mm. school so there wasn't there wasn't homework there wasn't chores there wasn't asking him to do anything it was just he came home he changed out of his uniform and that was it for the next hour two hours mm. he was left to just decompress find himself go through his processes of getting rid of all of his stresses and then only would he be able to kind of face the homework and all of the other things that needed to go right before that it was nightmares and sleepwalking and um, he would just have really, really lots of stress, wouldn't eat, wouldn't be able to concentrate. 
so you know it, it right. presents different scenes. some some children just they harm themselves some children just become very introverted they become very withdrawn it all depends on the child and how they're coping and what's going on inside of right them. but a lot of the time you don't see that because once they step out the door to face the world the mask goes on right okay and and what was the difference then with your with your young one um, my younger one, because my eldest had already been diagnosed, there is an awareness that there's a genetic predisposition that additional children very likely will carry the um, autistic, I wouldn't say gene, but they are more likely to be autistic. Mm -hmm. And um, he started showing signs and symptoms of it or traits, characteristics of it when he was quite young. Um, and the GP was very, very lovely, absolutely understanding of all my concerns when I went to raise them with her. By the time he was three, we had already kind of got the referral in place and he was assessed, diagnosed and had everything in place by the time he was five. Right. Right. There you go. Um, so it is, I suppose it is. Uh, I mean, have you found with obviously subsequently you, you've gone on to be a coach, so you are helping um, other parents. But do does this seem to be quite a new thing because they weren't diagnosing it early on? Um, I think it's a mix of both. I think that there were a lot that were missed, yes, mm. um, overlooked. And I also think that because it is something that, is more in the news and is more focused on there are a lot more parents that are seeing things in their children and wondering is that autism isn't it autism so a lot oh. more children are being put forward for assessment right. um, but that also comes down to perhaps a, a lack of proper understanding of whether their child is yeah autistic. so it's awareness it's it, yeah. it, it's it sounds like it's awareness um um, because again, we have these, you know, uh, we we have these preconceived uh, ideas of an what an autistic child uh, is gonna is gonna look like. We have all these stories that have been created that uh, this is gonna look like this. So people, uh, I suppose, are less likely because they're gonna be ignorant, right? They're gonna be ignorant to 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 this kind of, you know, and that's not in a bad way. It's we're all ignorant. I'm ignorant yeah. about that. Like, an awful lot of things um yes. but it's 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 it, it sounds like that maybe because of the what there is definitely more awareness overall with all mm -hmm. you know with all sorts of things from mental health to um any child with special needs and uh, you know trying to more include them in general schools rather than keeping them in 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 specific um mm -hmm. schools for them which yeah. Yes, I, I think that's a majorly important thing because uh, the other children need to have compassion and yes. be able to 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 talk and work with children with special needs too. And I, and I do think that maybe in the past, um, because they did tend to go to just special needs schools, yeah. that the children weren't didn't weren't coming across them. So there probably was more. Uh, it was going to be more bullying because they they didn't have the understanding or they weren't being taught yeah. by teachers and by their parents. Yeah. Um, so with yeah. it, with like now, with what you do now, um, helping uh, other parents deal with it, how do you, um, how do people come to you? Is it, is it, is it after they've been tested or is it where they're a little bit suspicious and they want to know what the process is um, as to go about getting, uh, getting them, uh, tested? Um, it's a little bit tricky at the moment because a lot of the time when you get a diagnosis or when parents get a diagnosis, um, the instinct is I know what to do because there's so much information out there so I'll just go ahead and do it Google. and I'll find what I need to do. Yes, Google. <laughs> Google is king. <laughs> But Google isn't king in this It's instance. not the answer. <laughs> I can bet, even though I haven't looked it, 
but I'm just going to go on a guess that if you were to Google it, you'd get a thousand ideas one way and another thousand in the completely opposite way. Would I be sort of on track there? You would. You would be absolutely on track. Um, and that's that's what a lot of parents do. That's what I did, um, to be to be fair and honest. Um, that's what I did initially was kind of, you know, found out this was it. And when you get the results and you get the reports and you, you get all this, it's not a lot of information that you're given from, you know, the clinicians and the organizations and all of that. So you kind of left with, okay, so I've got this diagnosis and I've got this and, and high functioning autism is not a, cl a clinical diagnosis anymore. You kind of, you get a blanket diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And sometimes yeah. you get a breakdown of level one, level two, level three, and that is an indication of mild or moderate or severe autism. And that's about it. And then you go and you find out the information for yourself. And I did that. And I just, I felt like Alice going down the rabbit hole. Oh. You, just, you just get lost in all this information. And, you know, and then I kept on looking at the information and I kept on looking at my child and I kept on going, they say that this should be happening, but it's not. Does this make it? better does it make it worse is he right. should he and it just kept on driving me crazy and eventually I, I just kind of went okay that's it I'm stopping mm. and I'm just gonna focus on my child and a lot of parents do that when you get that information you kind of go okay find out google books online chats everything and you do get help I'll be honest, you get help from online chats, you know, lots of parents that have lots of different experiences. But the thing that I found is that no matter how similar someone's experience is to yours, it's never the same. It's never going to be. Why would it be? Why, why would it be? Just because they're on the spectrum. Out of all the children with multiple different types of personalities and different, that have different lives, why would a child with special needs be exactly the same as each other? I mean, it, it, it's crazy for them to even think that that would be the case. They're all going to be, um, yeah. um, each one is going to be completely different. I would have, I would have guessed. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Because, yeah, we're, we're, we're human, right? After all. <laughs> takes all sorts it does so, take all sorts so but yeah it must have felt very challenging in the beginning when you first so going back to your 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 eldest child do you, how to how old did you say is 18 he's in his 20s now he's in his 20s so he's, he's an adult now um and he was 12 was that right when he was actually assessed and 16 when he was finally yeah. yeah okay so how did you feel i mean you, you know your child is nearly an adult he's had to go through all the challenges he went through throughout both schools and then you've got that final assessment when he was 16 you've gone down the rabbit hole how was that on you how did you feel it's exhausting it's draining it's confusing it's frightening it's a lot of things um I think I was better equipped than a lot of parents though, because I was teaching. And as a teacher, I work with a lot of children with different needs. Um, and I worked very closely with the special education coordinator in school. So I had more knowledge and more understanding of what we were dealing with even before he had the diagnosis and the assessment. So, you know, we were already able to put things in place for him well before he had the assessment. Right. But even so, when you do get that final kind of assessment, you have a lot of mixed feelings. You you feel relieved because you know, now I know. Yeah. Um, but then you also kind of, okay, so what does this mean? And what don't I know? And how is this going to impact on my child? What does it mean for my child? What does it do to their chances for the future? 
Mm. And a lot of parents kind of then go, but I don't want the world to know about it because that's going to affect oh. my child and that's going to affect his or her education and their job opportunities and their prospective careers. And that's another reason that a lot of parents don't ask for help in what they need. Okay. Because, because they feel, they think it's going to have a negative impact. Yeah. Um, Oh, yes, it's uh, it's I can sort of see both sides, you know, I can see sort of both sides as a worried parent. You know, it's it's not that they don't, you know, they they want the best for their child. Um, yeah, very, yeah. very difficult. But, you know, there's there's so I presume there is a lot of help. You know, it doesn't have to be that bad. Is that, you know, there is a lot of help out there. Um if they decide, if they actually admit and, and and go for it. That's the thing, though. I mean, statistically, only 22% of autistic children or adults are in full-time employment. And when parents start looking at statistics, that makes them really, really worried. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Um, but that's where I come in, see, because the way that I approach everything is that every single child is unique. And for me, my experience with high functioning autistics, both my own children and those that I worked with when I was teaching, is they are absolutely amazingly intelligent and mm. they can do so many things. It may not necessarily be in the way that you want them to do it, but if you can just find way to how they process and that's the important thing you need to find the key to how they process things how they understand things how they work things out in their brains and once you you can figure that out what they can do and how they do it and how they process things and how they understand things and how they what they can do is just amazing and there's nothing that can hold them back as long right. as you are there to help them support them and if you can if you can meet their needs as a parent then you can help them to get to wherever they want to be right. in whatever way that is necessary for them and so it sounds like they're going to be like um for instance is it adhd that um uh quite often oh no dyslexia dyslexia quite often they you know we now know that put them in managerial positions because they see big picture and another people would be better at doing the individual thing so just because they're dyslexic and can't you know not very good at the finer detail they're going to be more visionary um which obviously is quite a blanket i always quite find that fascinating in itself that that's quite a but it does tend to be the norm that that's quite a, 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 a general thing. So what is there, does there tend to be a general or a specific type of work that would be better for people that are on the spectrum or even is that completely individual? That is completely individual as well. Um, again, that comes down to stereotypes. People think, um, when they think autistic people, they often think of um, Rayman and, you know, um, Dustin Hoffman and really really good with maths and figures and then you think of Ben Affleck if you've watched The Accountant um, the movie yes. where he's absolutely brilliant with figures and things like that and there are autistic high functioning autistics that are absolutely brilliant with figures but then there are those that are amazing artists right and there so there is a uh, there isn't a blanket thing yeah right okay and, you know the the creative people and there are those that are inventors and there's those that love writing so it's not so it sounds like they actually end up excelling at whatever it is that they are passionate about or you know or good at yes um so it's finding the which i suppose is is what we need to do with every child and i suppose the whole problem with the current state of the school system is that it tends to focus on one type. Yes. 
and not the it's others. You know, certain them. things are considered as not as important yes. as other subjects. And and, yeah. and I've, I, I do find that a huge shame. I've got two very different daughters. Um, one is more the creative, one is more the mathematical. And, and, you know, they're equally brilliant. It's just... You know, one you know, school favors one and not and not so much yeah. the other. And yeah. um that does seem a shame. So actually, if that's for the quote unquote normal children, <laughs> then anybody that isn't in that little box that they put people yeah. in um is gonna yeah. be left out um even yeah. more so. Very much um, so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So how do um so you know what what do what do parents do what what's what's the answer then i always say parent the child in front of you not the one you wish you had not the one everybody says you should have but the one that is right in front of you not the one that google says you should have <laughs> yeah there you go you know google has its place but and especially when it comes to things like this absolutely not and and that so, you know, there you go. It's another thing that we tend to, you know, and again, generalizing, worry so much about what other people think. Yeah. And then you've got to take a step back and just focus on, yeah, focus on the needs of, of the child that's in front of you right now um, yeah. and go with that. So, uh, I mean, do you see there is a real issue with this sort of all across the country um, in, in schools or do you think things are getting better? Um, I think that there is an effort to make it better. Um, but I think it's a lot more complicated than just what generally happens in schools. And I say this from my perspective of having been a teacher, which is it comes down as a directive that we're going to do this in schools um, but the actual practical reality of how it works in schools tends to be a lot more difficult to put in place. Um, and also teachers are very individual people. So mm. some teachers will take what needs to be done and do it in a way that is done with compassion and caring. And mm -hmm. other teachers will do it as a, this is a directive, we have to do it in that sort of dismissive way where it's got to be done so the right. and the caring is not as ingrained in what they're doing as it should be and right. uh, it's just a case of potluck right yeah what what can you do to change that i mean i suppose it's uh, and again like you know we don't know what we don't know so i suppose if you've not had any experience which is why people like yourself are, are totally you know it's you're needed aren't you because you've been through it you understand you've gone through all the emotions of everything and and then you you're, you're in the perfect position to help guide support whereas a teacher that's just getting on you know and has never come across any of this it's going to be even more of it it's going to be you know for some it's going to be more of more of a challenge mm. um and uh, you know there's yeah, there are i suppose you teachers, you know this as as you were one yourself. They're just under so much pressure. Yes, right. Yeah, so yeah. much to do, so much to um, so you know all the bureaucracy so many of it. Boxes as to tick. To yes, so many boxes to tick. Yes, which is a shame because the whole point of you being teachers is that you can go go and teach, and you're sort of <laughs> almost being taken away from that to do all the other unimportant stuff. That's just for. Yes stats yeah. <laughs> Very much um, which, so. which, which yeah. does seem a shame um, yeah. I mean do you miss teaching or do you uh, do you feel that you're just totally on purpose now you know helping and supporting other parents I feel that I'm doing what I should be doing um I feel that when I was teaching I I was doing what I was supposed to be doing and I'm happy that I did what I did but I wouldn't want to go back now now i think this is my purpose i feel this is my purpose i know how much we struggled i know how difficult it was and i wouldn't want any parent listening to me to think that i have all the answers and my my challenges and my struggles with raising high functioning autistic children is over 
I don't think it ever will be as a parent of high functioning autistic children. I'm still every day learning something new about my children. I still have challenges that I have to deal with. And it's not something that, you know, you kind of have all the answers and that's it. It's done dusted. I know exactly what's going on with my child and no day after today is going to be a challenge. It's not that. No. It's never that. Yes, you get to know them better every day and you get to manage challenges better every day. But there are days where it still knocks you out of the blue and you still have to figure it out and you still have to overcome new challenges because they will have new challenges that will come along that you haven't come across before and you still have to learn it. But the better you know your child and the better you know how they react to certain things, the better able you are to help them with new challenges. So, you know, it's a lifelong thing that you're going to have to do. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and your eldest, so you're just trying to, what, what, what is he doing? What has he chosen to do out? Um, he's at uni at the moment. So, um Fantastic. We'll see what he does when he finishes. Does he have an idea? Does he know what he wants to do? Um, he's not 100% certain right oh. now. He's interested in a couple of things. He's interested in engineering, but he's also interested in kind of abstracts. So they don't quite go together. with. <laughs> okay so yeah so he's still got to figure it out but and and how is he have you noticed a big change so okay so he was at secondary school 16 when he was finally got the um the assessment back now is in uni because of you know uh obviously you 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 were dealing with stuff before then but do you think things, a lot of things have changed and has he changed being in that environment as opposed to when he was at school and he hadn't been assessed? Some things have changed. Um, he's, the support that he's put in place for him is a lot easier. Um, so in that respect, yes, we don't have to fight as much to get him the kind of the support he needs, the extra time for exams and things like that. Um, he's there are challenges for him because being diagnosed at that age he went through most of his developmental stages in life being neurotypical and now suddenly he's got to kind of absorb this idea that he's not neurotypical and it's okay to be neurodivergent and be what he is and there is a challenge in him between what is learned behaviors and what is natural behaviors okay which comes up sometimes so there are still challenges that happen um about what he should do and what he wants to do and what is right for him and what is still learned behaviors right so there are still those things that come up yeah sure i mean i I, I, well i'm sure that happens with uh uh, with a lot of children and well a lot of adults you know we all um quite often do things because we think we should yes and that's the way and that's what we're taught like like very possibly with um i mean I'm sure being a teacher has helped you with this, so that that's that's possibly why you're doing it. But I'm sure you know it's it's a standard career, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I'm sure you know it's thought of to do certain jobs and maybe not follow your actual passion. Um, yes. And and it is uh, you know going with that, going with your gut. So yes. going with what you want to do rather than what you think you should do. I think that's 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 possibly for everybody everybody out there but more uh more intense with children that are going to be um be like that because the, it, it, the whole thing it sounds is, is a lot more intense is it how has it affected your family as a whole um 
not as much as I think it affects some other families, probably because from the time he was young, we always knew that there were developmental issues. And from the time he was in primary school, every single year, I think they got just, they just got fed up of me because I kept on saying he needed to be assessed every single year, every single teacher, every well, single parent's evening. So we but always good knew. good for you, but good for you. You've, it, I mean, it's a shame that, you know, you have to fight um, it's because it, it is it's almost like a battle isn't it you've got to just keep going keep going keep going um, but thank goodness you did because I'm sure he would be having more challenges now if he hadn't right yeah and, yeah. and how's your younger son doing um, it's very different for him I think because he was diagnosed so early he just accepts it as part of who he is um, mm -hmm. so there's no major challenges about it it's just learning about what it is to be autistic so he's got questions about what it means and what you know how does it work and how how does his brain work differently to other people right and, that, and I mean I suppose that is it you know it's it's can we come away from this belief system that there's something wrong yeah all children, they're all perfect, just different. The way, you know, yeah. like, I don't know, an introvert versus an extrovert, yeah. how they deal with things, how they process things. You know, I, you know, all this, we're, in one way, we, we're sort of taught separateness. Yes. And then in, a, in another way, contradicting way, uh, we're all supposed to be the same and we're exactly. not. Yes. So I suppose it is, it's not just the child understanding themselves and how they process versus that person but yeah. also everybody else around the other children yeah. having um teaching them co co again compassion rather than because you're different to me uh you know they, they, and they and they get bullied to have that yeah. understanding that we are all different and you know people that are more like this need process in this way and they need this to help them this person and, and and I think that's going to go into the workplace as well and like you say yeah it is going to be a good manager that's going to realize that okay somebody like this is going to be perfect for that role yeah. and then somebody who's a bit more like this is going to be perfect for that role and they're both as important as each other there's no yeah. better than the other no worse than the other and build a team uh, of people that can do the job as best yeah. to the best as uh uh, yeah. They can. But so for you, problems. with regards to, so if, if any uh, parents out there who are going through it, and especially if they are um, going through that fear of mm -hmm. do they um, do a test because they're worried about what's going to happen um, further down the road or, and whether it's going to be uh, beneficial or they don't want to make things worse for their child maybe yeah. it's just a, a good idea just to reach out and have a conversation right anytime yes so for, for just the listeners obviously depending on where you're watching this or listening to this um if it's on the website or youtube or the blog uh moon's de uh, details are actually underneath so you can just click on the link but to just the listeners on meet wave radio or on the podcast uh how would parents get in touch with you? Where would they find you? The best place to find me is on LinkedIn. It's the easiest way to find me. Just look up Moon Said. My details are there and you can just message me. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. Best Fantastic. Way. And how, so how, what's your process? How do you work with, um, how do you work with people with uh, children that may, you know, benefit from being assessed? At the moment, I work with parents on a one-to-one -one basis, so it's the best way for me and for them because each child is individual. Mm. And when I work on a one-to-one -one basis, it is that parent, that child, and specifically what is happening with that child and the, the needs and the strategies that that family needs in order to be able to parent the child's needs, but also the parent's needs, because it's very difficult to suddenly start parenting a high functioning autistic child. As a parent, we grow up 
being taught a certain way of parenting and we watch our parents and then we watch the television programs and then we read all the books that say you should do this and you should do that and you should do that and even when you're expecting your first child you get all these books that say you should do this and you should do this and you should do that um and when your child is born they're not born with a sign that says i'm going to be autistic yeah so you do all the no normal parent things and then you get this diagnosis that says your child is high functioning autistic or autistic and suddenly all these things that you've learned about parenting just don't work and you uh -huh. end up thinking I am such a horrible parent I'm a failure I don't know what I'm doing but it isn't that it's just that you have to learn a different way of applying your parenting skills and that's what I do as well it's not just parenting the child's needs but it's also helping the parents to see that what they know can still be applied just in a different way different way so for anybody out there who you know might have some suspicions what would you say are typical if there are any are there any typical sort of signs to look out for there are some indicators that I suppose would be typical um, but again there are so many that are unique um, I think the best thing to do is speak to your GP about your concerns um, anything that you feel is setting off those alarm bells in your head because you know your child better than anybody else speak to your GP speak to if there is somebody in your child's school that you trust, a special education coordinator, speak to them and stick with it. If you feel that your child needs to be assessed, stick with it. Don't let somebody else tell you there's nothing wrong with your child. You know, argue about it, fight for it and make sure yeah. that you get your child assessed because it, cause it's going to benefit your child. them. It's yeah. all about your 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 own, your own children. Yeah. Um, okay, so for them to come to you, so you start with a, do you offer a, a, just a, a conversation? Do you do it on Zoom? Do you do it in person? How do I you do, work? Um, I do Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. Not everybody that I speak to is in the UK, and I'm based in London. Most of the people that I speak to are not. So right. online Zoom is uh, where I'm at, and I offer a free 30 minutes conversation just to see what's going on with you so you can meet me I can meet you and we can figure out what's happening um, and then from there we see what works best for you but as I said it's all one-to-one -one at the moment um, mm -hmm. because that is what is yeah best for you. yeah I would have thought it's a very difficult thing to do in a in a in a group setting because of yeah. the wide sort of um, yeah. range of well it, challenges you know um because well like you say I mean different because your younger son was assessed earlier but even with that what were what were the sort of main differences between them they are completely different <laughs> ah, like <yeah>, any child <laughs> surprise surprise really <laughs> they, they have I mean they have some similarities but they are completely any similar different. challenges you know just the chat the specific challenges that they have um they are both quite set in their ways they both have certain routines that they like to keep um they both like certain certain things of theirs uh, to be kept separate um they one likes his things to be put in a you know in a certain way and the other likes his things to be put in a completely different way but it's but the fact that it needs to be ordered and it has to be yeah. right okay yeah but the way that they order it and where they put them and how they put them is completely it's different. different right um one is quite creative and the other is quite structured so they're very different yeah um their tastes in food are different they i mean they're high functioning autistic but they're just so completely different and that is again where I say that every child is unique because I know they are just so different yeah so what do, what do you foresee now moving forward um challenges for in the workplace 
Um, for my children or just for well, autistic? for for yeah, or, or any autistic to any chil- uh, children on the spectrum, really. Do you think that things are changing? Is there more awareness? Uh, what what else do you think needs to be done to make to create more awareness uh, and for them to realise that it's not that it's going to be a benefit and not a um, not a problem? There are lots of challenges ahead. I think there is a growing awareness. Um, my f- concern is that the awareness, like a lot of awareness uh, these days is a token awareness in some instances so yes we're aware that there are autistic people and um, we need to fill the quota of autistic people in our company so we'll do that but there are some employers that actually genuinely do make the effort to have an environment that is suitable for autistic people because they recognize the value that autistic people can bring to their business to their company yeah yeah there's going to be but it does sound like yeah if people were a little bit more aware of differences in general well you know uh, you know with all of us that the fact that not everybody operates in the same way not everybody is going to react in the same way to 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 whatever to certain stimuli within the company and that if they are aware, they're not going to put everyone in the same uh, box and uh, yes. take that one off. And, and, and every, it's going to be a win-win yeah. rather than the resistance or causing. I mean, do, do, do you notice within your, you know, your own children that um, if they do go then, you know, outside of that environment, that safe environment of the school now being aware, do they, do they deal with the, uh, no, anxiety issues when when they take them yeah. into a totally different ar- arena yes very much so um there's a lot of anxiety with different places different people different um sounds different smells um there's also the anxiety that comes with how people react to them and that again comes down to the fact that the general bias is that they don't look autistic um my younger one gets that a lot because he's young and people tend to kind of see anything that he does out of well behaved as right. bad behavior or undisciplined um, yes. and it is just you know if ever i've said anything or when i say something it's always oh, he doesn't look autistic are you sure he's autistic oh. mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you just kind of, yeah okay so um we've taken to just learning to ignore right. what people don't understand um but there is that anxiety that comes with it so yeah if it's not just anxiety for the children, but it's anxiety for the parents as well. Yeah, well, that's what I was just going to ask then. What about you and how, yeah. um, you know, what do you need to do to avoid burnout as a, as a parent? Um, what sort of tools do you use to sort of, um, yeah, help help with the, the stresses that you are going through with dealing with all of this? Um one of the first things that I've had to learn and accept is that perfection is an illusion. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, it's total illusion. You're never going to get there. So stop chasing it. And nobody else is perfect either. And that's the thing. See, for, for parents of high functioning autistics, everybody has the solution. Everybody knows how you should raise your child and everybody has the unsolicited advice. If you just do this or... Do do you you get that a lot? Yes. Do you get that a lot? Oh, I did used to. I don't anymore because I've learned not to listen. So when people kind of start with, have you just... uh, I, 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 I turn around and I say, been there, done that. And we kind of, we're quite happy with what we're doing at the moment. Thank you. So, but you do, you do. And it tends to come from your loved ones, family, friends, because they don't quite understand the challenges 
so you know if you just do this or one that parents tell me they hear a lot is from family if i just have that child for just one day i'll get them sorted out <gasps> you kind of oh my goodness how oh. insulting oh dear oh dear well uh, you know you you hear this a lot that quite often it can come from the people that are closest to you because maybe others wouldn't dare to even say it <laughs> sometimes when people are too close to you that they feel that they they might feel that they have a, a yes. some kind of right yes. but um yes i can imagine even going through all of that must be must be quite draining on, on, on you is. as a person it is yes mm. and then of course you, you do get the family members that don't believe that your child is autistic because they don't look autistic they don't act autistic they don't sound autistic right? <sighs> autism doesn't look like that <laughs> and you, it, how do you i've had parents ask me how do you deal with family members who don't believe and don't they don't understand so they don't right. believe that your child is autistic and that's really challenging but when that happens i often say to parents just you know your child you yes. know your child so trust yeah. yourself there you go trust trust in yourself and then with family members like that just don't go as often and don't stay as long <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Very much. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't mean you have to cut them out. It just means. Yeah. <laughs> and prepare yourself. Go uh, yeah. uh, emotionally uh, supported. Yeah. <laughs> just, just understand that they don't understand. Yeah. As long well, as well, we remember. Uh, yeah. Remember like I said that earlier, we don't know. We we just don't know what we don't know. But we don't. Um, know. And they have no tell. idea what you do. So as long as mm. you, you, I, mean, I do that very often. I, I probably not very pleasant to say, but I do that very often when people say, why don't you just do this? Or why don't you do that? Or, you know, it's so easy. And I, I, I often stand there and I look at them and I think, you have absolutely no idea. As long as I remember that you don't know what don't it know. actually takes to do what I do, then I feel okay. Because right. I know what my struggles and my challenges are. You don't. Yeah, sure. So as long as I remember that within myself, no matter what you say, you, you can't. You can stay calm. Yes. <laughs> you can't rattle me. Because you won't walk a day in my shoes kind of thing. No, there you go. But I mean, I, I mean, do you get, do you worry about, I mean, how are they, would they be totally on their own? Is it something that you worry about? Do you, you know, would they be fully, fully independent? Or would you, would you, well, I suppose you're always going to worry about your children, but. You always worry about your yeah, children, no well, matter. <laughs> you always will, but are, will they be okay? Are they quite okay on their own? Um, I would not. Your older one say that i would say that they would always need to have a checking extra um, help yeah right. always no matter how old um, so there's no always... time off for you so how do you deal with that side how do you to sort of take a break um i've learned to take a break with them right if that makes sense yeah so there's a time where you always you're always being kind of the conduit. You're always being the one who interprets the world for them. But there's times when I just switch that off and I'm just mum. Right. I'm interpreting anything. I'm not explaining anything. And sometimes I just say that to them. Right. For the next X amount of time. That's yeah. it. I'm not, I'm not interpreting. I mean, that sounds like a skill in itself that you've got to learn. So, well, Thank you for your time today, uh, Moon. I mean, it's 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 been enlightening for me. Uh, yeah, I, I have no experience with that as well. So I'm sure for any listeners that if that you're concerned, please get in touch. Please. Um, so yes, thank you for your time, and to the listeners, I will be back next week with a coffee with Karen. Bye for now. Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast 
a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs, from a mental, physical and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo.